Let's pray. Father, I've got some, some words that are on my heart, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we don't want to really hear from me. We want to hear from you, Father. So I just pray that this morning you would make these words live, Lord, with your spirit. And that you continue to speak as you have been speaking to us, Lord. That your words would live in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Are we rejoicing? I, I have a distinct impression that I've, I've preached something like this a few weeks ago. Um, and I don't want to repeat myself, but it doesn't really matter if I do, does it, really? Because I believe that the Lord's speaking to us. He's got something that we want to hear, and maybe he needs to say it a few times before we get there, before the penny drops, you know? Um, when, when, when Sharon gave me a material, I was reading it, I was thinking, this is what I've got. That's <laughs> very, very strange. Um, yes. Um, but this is what the Holy Spirit is, is, is speaking to us about. So, um, when you look rejoice up in a dictionary, um, it says that. It says to um, feel or show great happiness, um, which um, I don't know, seems a bit lame to me, a little bit weak, maybe. Um, joy seems to be more than that to me. Um, the writers of the U.S. Constitution, the founding fathers of the USA, uh, there they are. Um, somebody can probably name them, but I can't. Um, said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Um, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They thought that pursuing happiness was an important thing to do. Pursuing happiness. Um, and un- <laughs> uh, 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 They're pursuing happiness. They haven't caught it yet. <laughs> they thought that pursuing happiness was a, an important thing to do. Not only that, it was an unalienable right given by God. Is that the same as rejoicing? I don't think it is, I have to say. I think that, um, maybe they they meant something particular by it. I'm not sure. It was a long time ago, and words change their meaning, don't they? Um, Paul told the Corinthians, um, I'm going to have to keep looking over my shoulder because I don't quite trust this thing. Um... He said that as servants of God, they were sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And that seems to be a, a, almost a contradiction in terms. How can you be sorrowful and yet rejoicing? Always rejoicing, in fact. Um, maybe these terms mean something different from what we thought. And I want to keep that phrase in the back of our minds um, as we go on. We'll come back to it. How is it possible to be sorrowful and yet always rejoicing? Does it even make sense? Perhaps like the um, founding fathers of America, they hadn't got very far in their pursuit of happiness. Um, The Bible takes a a different angle. Um, As we've just seen, Paul told the Christians in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. I said again, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How can he tell people to rejoice? 
How, how dare he tell people to rejoice? Actually, rejoice. That's some, um, sometimes it doesn't seem as if you can rejoice for various reasons. You people, he says, rejoice, always. Rejoice. Never stop rejoicing. Is that kind of challenging? Rejoice in the Lord. I think that's the key. Rejoicing in the Lord. He is the centre of our joy. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice, he says. Do not be anxious. Pray about it instead. Rejoice, do not be anxious. How are they supposed to do that? Is it even possible? What is it you said? You rant at all times? <laughs> we do though, don't we? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> communicate. Communicate with God. Yeah. Um, if you um, if you read some of the psalms, some of the laments, one of the one of the genres of 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 prayer and meditation that we have almost forgotten about is lament. Actually, where um, everything's come apart, the wheels have come off, and they're sitting in the ashes of Jerusalem, and there is apparently no hope. And yet they're turning to God. They haven't given up faith in God. They believe that God's faithful to his promises. They're not seeing these promises. And they're shouting at him. Where are you? How long? Will you reject us forever? How long will you hide your face from us? Will the enemy always triumph over us? How long? And there's this rant. <laughs> it's, there's there's a, a well-attested um, genre of, of, of prayer in the Bible, which is basically ranting, lament. That's what they do. When everything goes pear-shaped, they, they, they don't lose their faith in God. They're standing on the promises of God and they're confronting him with them. Where are you? I think sometimes we need to do this instead of kind of suppressing it and hiding it and pretending everything's okay. There's an evangelic smile on, you know. We're okay. Not okay. Sorrowful. Always rejoicing. We come to that. But sorrowful sometimes. Sometimes we need to be sorrowful. So, yes, that um, is another thing. Um, I want to um, bring in another passage that perhaps gives us more. I want to try and un unpick this idea that you can be sorrowful. We're always rejoicing. Um, let's have a look at what Peter has to say. This is near the beginning of his letter. It's a kind of introduction to uh, Peter, actually. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He says that they greatly rejoice. And that this rejoicing is set against all kinds of trials. Remember uh, Hebrews 12, 2, it talks about Jesus facing the cross for the joy that was set before him. And here they are, 
facing grief of all ki- in all kinds of trials, and yet they're greatly rejoicing. So apart from all the usual things that humans have to put up with, they had opposition from their neighbours, from the Jewish community, and then increasingly from the Roman authorities. And he says that they greatly rejoice in all this. Why? Because the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And in all this, you greatly rejoice. A lot of words there. I want to go through them line by line and unpick that like um, a woolen garment. They're greatly rejoicing. They're greatly rejoicing for particular reasons. As Paul told the Philippians, they're rejoicing in the Lord. Now, sometimes you think of rejoicing in the Lord, it's, it, it's kind of like a vague thing, maybe. Uh, rejoicing in the Lord, it can sound a bit airy-fairy, as if they're kind of tripping or something. What's up with him? He's rejoicing in the Lord. Again, it's like when, when Saul started prophesying. It's in 1 Samuel somewhere. And uh, they're saying, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? It's out of character. He's gone, tra- gone strange. He's got religion. Rejoicing in the Lord. But this rejoicing has got meat on it. It's not airy-fairy. Okay. Now, brother, this is right at the beginning of the letter. And instead of saying, I hope you're doing okay, which is what the, sort of, the sort of thing we would put in a letter, because we do hope they're doing okay, he knows they're not doing okay. So he doesn't say that he hopes they are. He says, I know that you're not doing okay. In fact, it's really difficult for you at the moment. You're suffering grief in all kinds of trials. None of which is your fault. But you know what? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just God, but naming him precisely. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That one. We're not looking at the things we can see here. We're looking through the fog towards God in the midst of all the stuff that's going on around us, in the midst of the bad news, in the midst of the frustration, in the midst of the pain and the trauma and the anguish and all the stuff that we're losing losing sleep over. We're looking through that by faith and we're going to praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like this. That's the um, Royal Navy's new toy for shooting down drones. It's quite impressive. And it works. It it, it will take down a drone. Um, I wouldn't... Yeah. It's punching holes in the night. And that's what it looks like. Can, we can imagine it as being like that. In the fog and the difficulty and the hardship, you're going to praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's like you're punching a hole in the darkness. And um, that's quite an impressive picture, actually. So why exactly are we going to do this? Why are we going to praise God? What's he ever done for us? In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does that mean? It means Jesus rose from the dead. We watched, um, we went to Stoke at the start with um, Sam and Vicky to see um, Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, oh, just, it was a great production, but it left me a bit nonplussed, I have to say. Um, 
And, and I've been nonplussed. It stops in a very dark place. Without the resurrection, there really isn't any bad news. Somebody said there are certain things in life are death and taxes. And it turns out that Jesus had plenty to say about both of them. Um, on taxes, he said, Matthew 22, he said, let Caesar have his money, it's no biggie. But give God what is due him. And on death, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I love that. He said it's a funeral. While comforting a grieving sister. Jesus rose from the dead. If we believe in him, we will too. This gives us a hope that nothing in this world can touch. He calls it new birth into a living hope. Now, I'm aware that this church, just like every other church, is an institution. We try not to be an institution, but we are an institution. We're conditioned to hear things like this, spoken from this lecture on Sunday morning. We expect it. We come with a bit of anticipation. But these truths don't always travel out through that door very well. And it is that, the door of opportunity, which Graham, in a moment of complete inspiration, named it. Because we have an opportunity to take the truths and the hope and the amazing message that we receive here out through that door into our lives. If we do that, if we carry the resurrection of Christ out of here with us and we apply it to our difficult lives, we will see a transformation. We really will. Jesus talked about being born again and now Peter's doing it too. He has given us new birth into a living hope new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A different kind of life where death has no power. Think about that for a moment. Is this not something we kind of dream of? This is the ultimate aspiration of humanity that we can live without fear of death. And he has given us that. We are born again. He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter says elsewhere that we're born again of an incorruptible seed. Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So an inheritance. Maybe somebody left you some money. That's helpful. Or maybe they left you a really weird oil painting. It, it, it kind of looks all right, but it doesn't really work. Some of these things here, it's just kind of, it's like a sort of optical leaning around. And um, I can't make out if it is like one of these psychological puzzles or if it's just not a very good painting. Um, uh, my great, 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 grand, great, great grandfather painted this sometime in the middle of the 19th century. And it looks like a photograph. It's actually um, oil paint on glass. Um, and it's a weird picture. Anyway, yes, um, so that's, that's my family heirloom. Um, <laughs> so, so, so. <coughs> and 
an inheritance. Um, Jewish pe- for Jewish people in Bible times, inheritance is a massive thing. They made a big deal of it. Um, each family had, was given by God, by God's promise, um, a small piece of land, which was their foothold in God's promise. This is their possession, it's their inheritance, this is their identity as the people of God. They have a piece of land which is promised to them. And every um, uh, 50th year, the Jubilee year, um, everything, because they bought and traded the land and, and, and sold it and rented it out, and all, but it all came back to the original owners every 50 years, because it was theirs by rights, by inheritance, God had given it to them. And it's theirs, God give it away. It really belongs to them, it belongs to God. Um, and that's their inheritance. So, um, in Moses' law, this is their guarantee of, of provision, and it's part of their identity. And obviously, for us non Jews, we kind of struggle to get our heads around that. Um, what, <laughs> what's that about? Um, and they uh, left the land for two years without farming it and just trusting God to feed them. And I don't think they ever did, actually. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of telling verses at the end of Two Chronicles that make, make you think, well, actually, maybe they never did that. Um, but, um, but that's what they were supposed to do. So that idea of inheritance, having a little bit of land that's your land, that's your heritage, um, meant a lot to Jews. Um, to us, it means so much. Um, it doesn't mean so much. But we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, that the Romans can't come in and steal. Um, no one can take it from us. Um, it's kept in heaven for us. It's kept in heaven for us. John um, 14. Jesus talking to his um, disciples at the Last Supper. Um, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's not just Paul. Jesus is at it as well. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That's what Jesus said. Jesus rose from the dead. He went into heaven to be with his father. And there he is preparing a place for us. So Jesus has gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you. An inheritance Kept in heaven for us. It's like a forever home, if you like. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. So, we are special. Um, because we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is to be revealed at the last time. And in all this we greatly rejoice. So, how far has Jesus got with his construction projects? I don't know. I mean, if he's putting the underfloor heating, or uh, I don't know, uh, or putting the roof on, maybe. I don't know how far he's got. But uh, he's building a place for us to be with him forever. That is a promise that he has made. And it's ready to be revealed at the last time. So, says Peter, in all this you greatly rejoice, (laughs) though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So, a point to what I'm saying, I will come to the point. uh, Paul tells the early Christians to always rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, always. And it's not about pursuing happiness. It's not about having a good time. Um, 
because if you do that, it's always going to be out of reach. Like the guys in the picture. It's about living our lives in the context of eternity and of God's rich promises. If we look at our circumstances, whatever they are, there are lots of difficult things. I'm not going to make a list. You know. We all know. Um, if we look at those things, they will eventually upend us. We just get swamped in all that stuff. And they will obscure the truth of God and his promise to us. But we have something better than all of these things. We live in the light of Jesus' resurrection and in the hope of our own. In life beyond death and life through death. I'm going to close with another short verse from Paul. It's a, a clue to living successfully day to day and being sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Since then, this is Colossians, beginning of Colossians 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Notice this is the past tense that he's using. He's not looking forward to a future thing. This is something that he's saying to these people now as they are sitting in their, wherever they are, in Colossae, going through whatever they're going through. He says, you have been raised with Christ. Right now, you are glorified with him. If that stretches your head a little bit, then join the club because that stretches my head too. I don't quite get it, but that's what he says. He says, right now, right now, it's a living hope. We're born again into a living hope. And he has risen from the dead. He is alive and he's preparing this for us. This is happening now. So how can we rejoice in the Lord? Always. We set our hearts on things above where Christ is. Then we can rejoice in the amazing things that he has achieved for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in your great mercy, you gave us a new and extraordinary hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us always to rejoice in this hope, in this great victory that you have won for us. Please help us now to take all our anxieties, all our fears, and lay them before you. To present our requests to you so that we will not be anxious about these things. And Lord, help us to set our hearts on the things above where Christ is and not to be overwhelmed with the stuff of everyday life. In Jesus' name, our Saviour who is alive and reigns with you. Amen. Amen. Right, we're going to sing. We believe in God the Father, maker of the universe.